Hello friends, I'm Chris. I'm from Transformation Nation Yoga and Wellness. And welcome to our Anatomy of a Sun Salutation mini workshop. So going through this year long program, when we get to uh, habit four, breath body practices, and we suggest that the 20 minute movement practice that we start the day with might be um, 10 or 15 sun salutations. For, for someone who comes from a yoga background, um, that's pretty simple and people just can just fall right into that. Uh, but a lot of people in, the, in these programs, they don't come from a yoga background, right? And the fact is, um, I remember something like my first 10 yoga classes, feeling completely lost, completely disoriented. Um, half of the post names were in Sanskrit. And that didn't even really matter because I didn't know what the post names meant in English, right? So we wanted to provide an opportunity to sit down and go through a, a pretty detailed explanations of sun salutations in a fairly holistic way. We also wanted to give a pose by pose breakdown. So you know what, if you think of points of performance for certain poses, um, what maybe to look for. Now, one disclaimer that I want to give you is I am cueing for these poses in the way that, that I teach them and I practice them. Um, the instructions that you get from me during this mini workshop, they are not the only way to do these poses and they're not necessarily the right way. They happen to be right for me and for most of my clients. But if you've got something that you've done in the past that seems to work better for you, or you take a class in the future and it's cued in a different way, I would always come back to the question, why? So feel free to reach out to me and I can explain to you why I've cued every single thing in this practice in the way that I have. And, but if you get cued differently than that and the way the teacher describes it makes sense to you and more importantly, it feels good in your body, then I would encourage you to just roll with that. Now, what I think you'll need to be comfortable and get the most out of your practice, um, part of this practice will be on the mat. So a yoga mat in two blocks might be really helpful, but it might be nice to have a chair or a cushion someplace comfortable to sit for the instructional part of this as well. So pause your recording, roll out your mat, gather up your materials, and when you're ready, press play, and I'll meet you on your mat for this Anatomy of a Sun Salutation mini workshop. If you're new to yoga, one of the other things that can be vexing to new yoga practitioners is the breath. So it, it's different than how we breathe in our day-to-day -day lives most of the time. Although I will say um, I've seen this happen for myself and for many other people, this breath that helps us move through adversity and difficult circumstances in our practice, it doesn't take too long before we find in our lives when we're facing some kind of adversity that we pick up unconsciously this same breath. So the breath that we're going to be using is called an Ujjayi breath. Now Ujjayi is Sanskrit for victorious, and it's sort of an ocean breath. So to set this up, what I'd like you to do, take the palm of your right hand in front of your face, and I'd like you to exhale into the palm of your right hand through your mouth as if you were fogging a mirror with a breath. Now, you might notice that constriction in the same muscles that you used to whisper at the base of your throat. So I'd like you to constrict those again. This time, exhale through your nose, but fog the mirror with your breath, the same constriction sensation. Good. Okay, now same thing as you inhale. And as you exhale. So breathing in this way, it adds texture, it adds viscosity, it adds a, a light sound like an ocean wave. Now, no problem at all if that breath is audible enough that you can he hear it. And it's really no problem if it's loud enough that other people um, in close proximity to you can hear it as well. So the other thing to think about with the breath, um, in vinyasa yoga, usually we, um, we inhale as we rise and we exhale as we fall. So the pattern is the same. So inhale, rise up into warrior one, exhale, release your hands down into the earth, high plank. So it'll follow that pattern. So once again, this breath work, that ocean sound breath with the constriction at the base of the throat, it's called Ujjayi breath. And in Sanskrit, Ujjayi um, means victorious breath. All right, welcome back friends. So with this anatomy of a sun salutation mini workshop, um, there's certain promises that I think you ought to be able to count on getting from me. 
right? So for example, why spend the time on this at all? Well, what I intend to do today is to discuss what a sun salutation is. I'll describe how a sun salutation is done. We'll go through the sun salutation sequence and we'll break down each pose, pose by pose. I will highlight key features of each pose. I'll provide you an opportunity to try each pose out and to feel it in your body. For both sun salutations A and sun salutations B, I will demonstrate a full sequence. And then I'll offer you an opportunity to work through a single sequence in tandem with me. So what exactly is a sun salutation? If someone who doesn't come from a yoga background has heard of any sequence of poses in yoga, they've probably heard of a sun salutation. But much of the time, we don't really know what this means. So the Sanskrit for sun salutation is Surya Namaskar. Surya means sun. Namaskar is a formal greeting. In some forms of yoga, and I'm thinking in particular of Hatha in various forms of vinyasa, Sun salutations are a fairly choreographed sequence of poses that are used early in the practice to warm the body. However, over the course of the practice, the sun salutation or vinyasa becomes a common factor in a common movement pool that links together component, different components of the practice. So why do we do them? Well, part of it is I feel like um, sometimes there's some comfort in having something that's fairly ritualized and familiar. And these familiar movements, class after class, a lot of times when people practice yoga for a while, when they get to the studio space on their mat, it feels like a refuge. And there's some comfort with having, uh, regardless of how different one practice may be from another, having this fairly familiar set of poses um, together. But sun salutations also help up to break up fascial patterns that may develop either over the course of a long day if we're seated all day or at night while we're laying in bed all night. They'll help us to move the body and deliver oxygenated blood to different parts of the body. And they also warm the body and help prepare for more movement. So with forms, these are, are really are fairly unlimited. But what you'll see in contemporary Western yoga um, often gentle sun salutations. So in the companion video, the 20 minute sun salutation breath body practice that we're co-releasing with this, it will start with five gentle sun salutations. Um, and then what you're probably more familiar with, sun salutations A, sun salutations B. But there's lots of other different ways to approach this. So for example, classical sun salutations um, often involve either a, a crescent lunge or a low lunge right from the very start of the practice. And creative teachers um, who are skillful in the craft of yoga will develop lots of different variations of sun salutation. And the reasons that they do this, I think to keep things interesting for their clients, to help prepare the bodies for different things to, depending on what the practice is intended for, but also to keep things interesting and motivating for the teacher. All right, so we're going to start with the sequence called Sun Salutation A. All right, so this is a sequence of about seven poses. So it's a mountain pose, a forward fold, halfway lift, high plank, a low plank, and then there's a hard opener. Now, what I would want you to know about hard openers, when a teacher calls for a hard opener, um, they may give it a specific name. They may sp say Sphinx, they may say e Easy Cobra, they may say Upward Facing Dog. These are fairly interchangeable. What I would say is on a continuum of sensation, least sensation would be Sphinx, most sensation would be Upward Facing Dog. So in my book, um, early in the practice, I'm generally gonna do Sphinx, um, and then ease into easy cobra. And then once my body's warmed up, I'm more likely um, to do an upward facing dog. But at any point in the practice, if a teacher calls for a sphinx or an easy cobra, but your body wants upward facing dog, you could do upward facing dog. Or later in the practice, for whatever reason, if the teacher calls for upward facing dog, you can substitute sphinx or easy cobra. These are interchangeable. And downward facing dog. We're gonna start out with mountain pose. So if you look at the gentleman in this picture, he's got stacked joints. His head is floating over his shoulders, which are floating over his hips, over his knees, over his ankles. The joints are stacked. The weight is in his heels. He has a neutral pelvis. His chin is level to the ground. He's 
you, you may not be able to see it here, right? Because the weight is in the heels, the body won't move, but for an engaged mountain pose, what I recommend folks to do is to engage muscles as if they were spreading the heels, thighs, and sits bones all toward the outside edges of the mat. So get into your mat, grab your block, and let's break down and look at mountain pose. So mountain pose is one of those poses where if you, we look at it just from a casual standpoint, um, it can look like we're just standing. Right, but I'd like to challenge that and show you what an, what an engaged mountain feels like. So come onto your mat up toward the top edge of your mat, bring your feet together. If it's comfortable for your, for your legs and your hips, big toes touch a little space between the heels. So the outsides of your feet make the shape of a number 11. Now, if you've had a recent joint replacement, like a hip replacement, or for practitioners who are pregnant, hip distance apart, friends, is just fine. It's just fine. Either way is okay. Now, from here, stack your joints, float your head over your shoulders, over your hips, over your knees, over your ankles, and shift the weight into your heels. Good. Scoop your belly button slightly up towards your sternum. So we want a neutral alignment of the pelvis. Bring your chin so it's level with the earth. Visualize enough space between your chin and your throat that you can hold, say, a tennis ball. Now, with the weight in the heels, hands maybe down by the waist, palms facing forward, fingers alive, but not over-engaged. Now with the weight in the heels, engage the muscles as if, as if you were trying to slide your heels out toward the outside edges of your mat. So the weight's in the heels, so no physical movement. I would like your ankles floating over your heels the whole time, but engage those muscles as if you were sliding the heels apart, good. Right, that will change. That alone will change your level of engagement. Now, ankle heels are continuing to slide apart as if they could. Spread your thighs apart like you were trying to press them out toward the outside edges of your mat. Good, that's it. So no physical movement probably, but lots of muscles turn on and engage. Now, your sits bones, the ischial tuberosities, the little bony protrusions that sit down into your chair or the floor when you sit down. Engage muscles as if you could slide those apart toward the outside edges of your mouth. Good, at the same time, soften the muscles around your eyes, soften the flesh around your eyes, soften the quality of your gaze. If you notice you've got your shoulder blades up toward your ears, you're wearing them like earrings, maybe on an exhale, but release all the soft tissue down toward the earth and let your shoulder blades fall down your back. Continue to breathe and hold that position right there. And this is Tadasana, a standing mountain pose. The next pose in the sequence is forward fold. So let, let me say friends that, that forward fold is um, like, like any pose in yoga, but this one in particular can really highlight some differences in the body. So in this picture, this is a pretty classical form um, so this particular yoga practitioner could be on the cover of a yoga magazine, right? Most people's forward folds do not look that easeful and picture perfect. That's okay. Um, the key features in my mind, the weight, first of all, is in the balls of the feet. So there's about a 70 to 30% ratio with 70% of the weight in the balls of the feet. Heels are light, about 30% of the weight of the body is in the heels. The neck is relaxed. So you might even imagine in a forward fold that there's a weight like a plum at the crown of the head, drawing the crown of the head down toward the earth. And the belly is resting on the thighs. So the person in this, uh, the model in this photo, this practitioner has by all appearances, pretty supple and flexible hamstrings and lower back, right? So she has fairly straight legs and she also um, has her belly resting on your, her thighs. It's a good forward fold. But for somebody with tight hamstrings or a tight lower back, a generous bend in the knees with the belly on the thighs and all the other key features in place is still a really good forward fold. So get back on your mat and let's take a look at trying out this forward fold in your body. I like to look at a forward fold. Um, so this again can just look like we're standing and we're not really doing very much. But I'd like to, again, challenge that. So I would like you guys for now, um, standing at the top edge of your mat, 
right? For me, I'm gonna change my positions just for demonstration purposes, but you guys stay right where you are. So from a standing mountain pose, this is often gonna be cued on an inhale, lift your arms up over your head, exhale, hinge into a forward fold. So start with the hips, hips come back first, start to put a bend in the knees and then fold forward. Now, one thing that you'll see a lot, it's not wrong to have straight legs and straight legs is not the goal. So if you look at my forward fold, if I have straight legs, I have a pronounced bend in my spinal column, right? That's not what we're looking for. So it's okay to have straight legs if you can have straight legs and a straight spine. If you have to pick between the two, a straight spine or straight legs, put a bend in your knees, rest your whole belly in your thighs. Now shift the weight into the balls of your feet, light in the heels. Relax your neck. So maybe visualize a weight at the crown of your head. Right, your feet can be together or at least in the beginning of the practice, it's really common to be cued for a ragdoll pose, in which case your feet would be hip distance apart. And this is forward fold. All right, so from forward fold, the next pose that will be cued is a halfway lift. So some of the key features are a straight spine. Now, if you remember in the forward fold, there was a 70 to 30% weight distribution with 70% of the weight in the balls of the feet, 30% of the heels. When we get to the halfway lift, we reverse that. 70% of the weight in the heels, 30% in the balls of the feet. Um, hands on shins or thighs. And again, if you look at the person in this photo, she has picture perfect straight legs. She has a picture perfect straight, straight spinal column, right? Most bodies are not gonna do that. And I'm gonna tell you, you will see when we get to the halfway lift, my body doesn't do the halfway lift in the same way that hers does. So I wanted you to be able to see this, but I want you to know that it's different. So it's not wrong to have straight legs, but if you have to choose between having straight legs or a straight spine, I would encourage you to put a generous bend in the knees and focus on having a straight spine. So now I'll meet you on your mat and I'd like you to feel this halfway lift in your body. Halfway lift is often perceived as just a transitional pose. So sometimes we allow ourselves to get a little bit sloppy in this shape. So I'd like to challenge that. So once again, I would like you standing close to the top edge of your mat so you can see your device. I'm gonna change my positions just for demonstration purposes. So from a forward fold, if you remember from a forward fold, the weight is in the balls of the feet, right? And the halfway lift is generally gonna, uh, almost always gonna come um, following the forward fold, right? So when we cue for a halfway lift, shift the weight into the heels. So it goes from the balls of the weight into the heels, leave the bend in the knees, place your hands on your shins or your thighs. Now, once again, like the forward fold, the goal is not straight legs. I would like you to have a long straight spinal column. So a straight line from the crown of your head to your tailbone. So again, it's not wrong to have straight legs, but if you have to pick between straight legs and a straight spine, pick the straight spine. And then usually here on an exhale, we'll be cued back into a forward fold or into some kind of transitional pose. From halfway lift, we're often cued to, toward a high plank. All right, so you can think of this as a high push-up position. That's what it is. So a, a couple things that I would want you to know. First and foremost, high plank on the knees is still high plank. And there are a lot of practitioners, particularly those new to yoga who are still working on, uh, who either are working on developing upper body strength to do a structurally correct high to low plank transition, or people who have a history of wrist or shoulder injuries, that it's really a much more favorable pose to do the high plank on the knees. In general, for key features, the hands will float over the wrist, but some people get compression in the wrist and it's painful like that, right? So if that's the case, know that you can take the hands forward of the wrist at any time. So it, this does two things. One, it helps create a much more favorable ang angle for the wrist. Um, the other thing it does, like a lot of times when we think about modifications, we think them, uh, think of them as making the, the practice easier, but you might try this high plank with your hands forward to your wrist. It's much harder to make the transition from high to low plank from a muscular engagement standpoint. Flatten the palms out on the mat. Index fingers are at 12 o'clock. 
the back of the head remains buoyant. The core is engaged. We press the heels toward the back edge of the mat and puff the space between the shoulder blades up toward the stars. And now let me have you move to your mat and I'd like you to feel this high plank in your body. Let's look at a high plank, Chaturanga Dandasana, often cued as a high push-up position. And that's not wrong. So we can get here from lots of different positions. But what I'd like you to look at is shoulders floating over your wrists. Although if you get compression pain in your wrists, walk your hands forward, right? That will make the pose more challenging and it changes the angle in your wrists um, to favor your body. But look at your index fingers. I would like those, if you think about the cardinal numbers on a clock at 12 o'clock, ground down, press down into your index knuckle and thumb. And look for this high push-up position. This could be done for your knee, from your knees. Or tuck your toes under your feet, lift up onto the balls of your feet. So I would like you to find a more or less straight line from the back of your head down to your heels. So to engage here, again, press down into your index knuckle and thumb, puff the space between your shoulder blades up toward the stars. I'd like your core engaged. That might feel like drawing your belly button towards your sternum and press through the heels toward the back edge of your mat. Now, one more cue here, knees up or knees down. I frequently see people, there's a very human tendency to let gravity draw the forehead down toward the earth. I'd like you to resist that and make the back of the head buoyant. So it's roughly in line with the back of your heart. So from high plank, the transition typically is gonna be either all the way down to the belly or to low plank. So some things that I would want you to know, first of all, uh, again, this, the person in this picture, this is lower than I would typically go for my low plank. What I'm looking for is someone to come halfway down, but also recognize that we can, we, we want to adjust these poses to fit our body and not adjust our bodies to fit the poses. So um, for a lot of bodies on the knees, this, the high to low plank transition from the knees is 100% fair game. So in that high to low plank transition, if we want to reduce sensation, we do it on the knees. If we want to increase sensation, we can lift the leg. Shoulders float over the wrist unless there's a wrist compression issue. Hands and arms stay shoulder width apart. Back of the head as the high plank remains buoyant, we come halfway down. Now I'll have you move onto your mat and I'd like you to feel this low plank in your body. Let's take a look at the low plank. This will often be cued either low plank or chaturanga. Um, so from a high plank, and again, note this high plank could be done for your knees or you could tuck your toes under your feet. So good alignment for your high plank first, all those points of performance that we talked about before, especially press down into your index knuckle and thumb. So from the knees or from tuck toes, um, chaturanga is coming halfway down. Now, one thing to note here, I would like your hands, your wrists, your arms, all to stay shoulder width apart. Let me turn to the side so I can show you what I mean. Sometimes there's a tendency to do what I think of as army ranger push-ups and let the elbows come out nice and wide. Instead of that, leave your hands, your wrists, your elbows shoulder width apart, come halfway down. And I'm gonna change positions one more time. So again, from tucked toes, shoulders are floating over the wrists. I'm pressing through the balls of my feet. My core is engaged. Back of my head is buoyant. Usually we do this on an exhale. We come halfway down. No army ranger arms. From the knees, it's the same thing, friend. It's the same thing. So with this high to low plank transition, um, you can kind of make this a concierge practice and make it fit your body. And in fact, that's what I do for my practice and I would encourage you to do the same. So what do I mean by that? If you're in a high plank with the balls of your feet on the earth and coming down low, that's too much sensation on your wrists, your shoulders or your arms. We reduce the sensation by coming down to the knees, right? Or if you're feeling um, like you've eaten your Wheaties as you might say, and you like to challenge it, you can lift one leg. This will add sensation to your transition. From a 
a low plank, we're going to go into a heart opener, right? So I already mentioned these are interchangeable. You can choose Sphinx, Easy Cobra, or Upward Facing Dog. And the alignment, there's some differences with each shape, but some of the things that are in common are that we press the shoelace parts of the feet, the tops of the feet into the earth. We soften through the belly. We relax the belly. Um, in general, in these poses, we drag the palms of the hands or the elbows, depending on the pose, back toward the waist. And we have a neutral forward gaze. So make your way back onto your mat. And I'd like you to be able to try out um, all three of these hard openers. So let's look at our first hard opener, uh, Sphinx pose. Now, sometimes um, early in the practice, this will be a really common hard opener that's cued. And then later in the practice, um, that often will be cued for, for a different heart opener that, that typically applies a little bit more sensation. So these are, from my perspective, are very interchangeable. If I cue a client for Sphinx pose, but they want to do upward facing dog, as long as their body's warmed up and ready, and I don't know that, I don't live in their body, only that person knows that, 100% okay. In contrast to that, if I cue someone later in the practice for upward facing dog, and what their body wants is Sphinx pose, I think they should do that. So let's start with Sphinx. Come down onto your belly, float your shoulders over your elbows. Use your hands, make in all, your forearms rather, make the shape of the number 11. Ground down into your index knuckle and thumb. Now lengthen the legs long, so you might lift the left leg, reach it far back behind you. Lift the right leg, reach it back to meet the left. Now here, the legs are engaged. What does that look like? Press into the shoelace parts of your feet enough that the knees start to lift or maybe they start to lift. Drag the elbows and the hands back as if you could re reach them back toward the waist. Now in practice, the weight of our, our upper body is on the elbows. They probably won't physically move. But at the same time, soften your belly. And I'd like your gaze maybe just ahead of the space right in between the tips of your index fingers. It could be a little further forward. What I don't want is you cranking your neck aggressively up. So find a shape that's gentle for your neck, something that you could do with your neck, not just a year from now or five years from now, but you could imagine doing in your practice five years from now. So if you do that, if you press the tops of your feet into the earth, drag your elbows back towards your waist, and soften through your belly, often you can get a, a little bit of a decompressive feeling in the low back. The next heart opener that I'd like to look at is Easy Cobra. So again, just as a reminder, you can mix and match all of these heart openers. Now, this will often be cued from a high plank to a low plank or from all the way down on our belly. But the way I would do Easy Cobra, hands under your shoulders, index fingers at 12 o'clock. And then we rise on an inhale. We always rise on the inhale. On an inhale, pull the heels of your hands back and towards your waist. Peel your heart up off the earth. Maybe it peels up a little, maybe it peels up a lot. Tweeze your elbows back and towards your waist. So I don't really want the elbows winging out. I want them tweezing in towards your waist. And press the shoelace parts of your feet down into the earth. I like to look at our third hard opener, upward facing dog. This will often be cued um, following a high to low plank transition. So let's set it up that way. So in this high plank, my shoulders are floating over my wrist. My index fingers are both at 12 o'clock. And you might be cued rock forward on your toes, float your shoulders over your wrist. Keep the back of your head buoyant. Exhale, low plank, come halfway down. Inhale, either open your heart or upward facing dog. So in this up dog, my shoulders are floating over my wrists. I'm dragging the heels of my hands back toward my knees. I'm pressing the shoelace parts of my feet into the earth. And my pubic bone is reaching for the earth. My gaze is forward. But again, I'm not cranking the back of my neck. I'm just maybe my gaze might be five or six feet in front of my mat. 
And then from that heart opener, generally in contemporary vinyasa yoga, we're cued for a downward facing dog. Now, I already mentioned in popular culture, at least in the United States, if someone has heard of some kind of a sequence of poses, they probably heard of sun salutation. But they, if they can name a single pose, it's probably going to be a downward facing dog. So this is fa fairly iconic in the yoga that's practiced in the West today. So some of the key features to look for here. So the palms are flattened down onto the mat. Usually index fingers are pointing at 12 o'clock. The neck is relaxed. We press the chest and the belly toward the thighs and we press the thighs toward the belly. The serratus anterior is turned on. So what does that mean? Serratus anterior is a muscle along the rib cage under the armpit, right? So in this video, I'm gonna cue you to drag your elbows down toward the earth by about three quarters of an inch and then tweeze the elbows together as if you were squeezing a beach ball between them. When I do that, I want you to feel for that, that area of muscle in your rib cage under the armpits to turn on. That's what we're looking for. I consider the serratus anterior to be the downward facing dog muscle. The other thing that I would want you to note, a lot of times you will see people do this with straight legs and that's okay. This can be done well with really good alignment with straight legs. But for people with tight hamstrings and lower back, a bend in the knees is just fine. And friends, a generous bend in the knees is just fine. So you'll see when we get onto your mat in a moment what my downward facing dog looks like. But I do this with a pretty, you could park a bus behind my knees. And it's still a really good structurally sound downward facing dog. So I'll have you move onto your mat. And I'd like you to be able to try out this downward facing dog for yourself. We're gonna take a look now at downward facing dog. So outside of yoga circles in pop culture, if people know the name of one yoga pose, it's probably downward facing dog. Uh, so one thing that I'll tell you about this, I'm gonna, I'm gonna give you six or eight different cues. Um, I understand that's a lot. There's a lot going on in that pose. Whatever expression that you end up with in this pose, um, consider this as progressive. We continue to build into this and, and grow. Um, I'm gonna share with you with full transparency, this is my 2021 understanding of downward facing dog. I would say downward facing dog, as simple as a pose as it seems to some people, um, I probably worked on downward facing dog for 12 years before I felt like I really kind of had it figured out. So from downward facing dog, or from say a high plank, we can press directly into downward facing dog. So start to lift the hips, up toward the stars. So your hands are at 12, your index fingers are at 12 o'clock and you'll often be cued at first to find some gentle movement to warm your lower body. So that might look like pedaling the feet and sometimes it's cued for that. That's dropping one knee in at the same time pressing the opposite heel back and going back and forth between those things. But you could also sway the hips from side to side. That's also right. And then eventually you'll likely be cued to settle into the pose. So when you settle in, let gravity draw your heels down to the earth. Your heels don't have to touch. They probably won't. And look, straight legs is not necessarily the goal. Look at my straight legs here. Look at the rounding in my back. So if you're tight in your lower back or hamstrings, put a bend in your knees, maybe a generous bend. Relax your neck. Let gravity draw the crown of your head down to the earth. You may be cute here even to shake your head gently. No, nod your head yes. Right, ground down into your index knuckle and thumb even more. Now, I'd like you to drag your elbows down towards your mat by three quarters of an inch for subtle movement, and then tweeze your elbows together like you were squeezing a beach ball. Good. From here, press your belly, your chest towards your thighs, draw your thighs towards your belly and your chest. Good job, friends. Great job, friends. So now at this point, those are the poses that I consider most common in, in what um, I, would, I would wish that had someone had given me uh, a cue what to expect when I first started practicing yoga. Now we're gonna put the whole thing together. Now I'm gonna run through two sun salutations A. So you could, you have the option, you could practice along with me both times. But what I recommend is watch me the first time, allow me to demonstrate, and then the second time you can get on the mat and we can work through this together. So we're gonna to put this all together in a flowing 
um, sun salutation A sequence. For this first sequence, um, I would prefer, uh, you don't work for me, this is my, I'm expressing my preference. I would prefer you just watch this first time. And then if you want to dig in and do the actual whole flowing sequence the second time through, feel free to do that. So if we start this, this will often be started from a, a grounding pose on the earth, like a, a child's pose, a reclining bound angle pose. But for our purposes today, let's start this from our standing mountain, right? So I'm not gonna give any cueing, I'm just gonna flow through it. So let me change my position just for demonstration purposes. So from a high mountain pose on an inhale, sweep the arms up over your head, exhale, hinge into a forward fold, inhale for a halfway lift, Exhale, step back into high plank. Inhale in high plank. Exhale, low plank. Inhale, open your heart. Again, you can mix and match any heart opener here. Exhale, downward facing dog. And then we'll reverse this. So on an inhale, bend your knees, look forward. Exhale, walk, step, or float to the top edge of your mat. So we're in a forward fold now. Inhale, halfway lift. Exhale, forward fold. Inhale, press into your feet. Sweep your arms all the way up over your head. And then maybe even from here, slice your hands down into heart center. So I'm gonna to put together one more sun salutation A. Um, if you'd like to just watch it this time as well, friends, 100% okay. You've got that other 20 minute breath body practice video that you can use in tandem with this. But if you'd like to follow along, Start from a standing mountain pose. So shift the weight into your heels. Scoop your belly button slightly towards your sternum. Bring your chin level to the earth. Slide the heels apart like you were trying to touch the outside edges of your mat. And then the same with the thighs, same with the sits bones. Hands down by your waist, palms facing forward. Gaze is soft. On an inhale, sweep your arms up over your head. Exhale, hinge into a forward fold. So hinge at the hips first. Put a bend in your knees. Rest your whole belly on your thighs. Shift the weight into the balls of your feet. Now leave the bend in your knees. Shift the weight into your heels. Inhale, halfway lift. Exhale, step back into a high plank, a high push-up position. Ground down into your index knuckle and thumb. Leave the back of your head buoyant. Inhale, rock forward. Pull your shoulders over your wrists. Exhale, come halfway down, knees up or down. Chaturanga. Inhale, any heart opener. So here I'm an up dog, floating my shoulders over my wrists, pressing the shoelace parts of my feet into the earth. Exhale, downward facing dog. On an inhale, bend your knees, look forward. Exhale, walk, step, or float to the top edge of your mat. Inhale for a halfway lift. Exhale, forward fold. Inhale, root to rise. Come all the way up to standing. Exhale, draw your hands down into heart center. And then maybe release them down by your waist, palms facing forward, gaze is soft, shoulders are relaxed. Amazing work, friends. That's a sun salutation A. Now we're gonna add a sun salutation B. And if you look at our list of poses, all of these, but three are familiar. We've done all of these um, as a component of sun salutation A. But the difference is instead of starting in mountain, a sun salutation B, the way it's generally practiced in the West is gonna, be, is gonna begin in the chair pose. We're also gonna add warrior one, that's really common. Warrior two isn't necessarily a part of the sun salutation sequence, but it often is included at the, as a component of the last sun salutation B of the practice. So I've uh, chosen to include it here. So let's start by looking at chair pose. So the key, what I consider to be the key features of a chair pose is we sit the hips back. Now this could be done um, higher up as a chair or hips much, lower down. As a general rule of thumb, I think it's really solid to start the practice with a higher chair and then go lower as you warm into the practice. Weight is in the heels again, and this time even a greater proportion of weight is in the heels. Roughly 80% of the weight in your heels, the balls of your feet are light, 20% of the weight in the balls of the feet. 
Look for a straight spinal column. I'd like you to find one long straight line from the crown of your head to your tailbone. Now with your arms, there's lots of options. You could, as long as the spine is straight, you could have the hands on the front thigh. You could have your hands, your thumbs together at your sternum, hands at heart center, or you could extend your arms up over your head with the biceps framing the ears, pinky fingers spiraling in toward one another. You'll open the heart to the front edge of your mat and draw the belly button toward the sternum. So now I'll have you move on to the mat and I'd like you to try this, this challenging but really strengthening pose in your own body. All right, friends, I'd like to look at chair pose. Before we get into the meat of it, um, let me show you a couple of modifications. And the first is, there's no reason you couldn't do chair pose at a wall. So I'd like you to bring your feet so they're hip distance apart. Make the shape of the number 11 with your feet. So your feet are probably a footprint and a half from the wall. And then lean your spinal column up against the wall. Your hands could be in your thighs. They could be a heart center. You could reach your fingers up toward the stars. This is all right, and this is all okay for chair. So if you try this, and I would encourage you to try it, this is not an easy pose, right? So when we think about modifications, usually people think that they're easy. My legs are on fire here. All right, so use good body mechanics. Lift yourself up onto your feet. So let's try this standing on the mat. So your feet can be together. They could be up to hip distance apart. But again, make the shape of the number 11. Now drop your seat back low, shift the weight right away into your heels. Now I'd like your spinal column to be straight. So a long line from the crown of your head to your tailbone. And as long as that's the case, your hands could be in your thighs, right? That's a legitimate chair. Your hands could be a heart center. Or you could reach your arms up over your head, biceps framing your ears, spiral your pinky fingers in toward one another. Weight is in the heels. Scoop your belly button towards your sternum. Good. Now, if your arms are reaching out over your head, press the bones of your arms toward the back edge of your mat. Good. All right, so what I'm in right now is a fairly high chair. That's okay. Your chair could be high every time. Or you could lower your seat any amount. But I'd like you to keep your heart open to a point past the top edge of your mat. So to open it up more, that might involve lifting your gaze. All right, friends, let's take a look at Warrior One. So in Warrior One, the key features are the toes on the front foot are at 12 o'clock. The toes on the back foot, if the, the right foot is in the front, the left foot is in the back, the toes on the right foot are at eight to 10 o'clock. And if the left foot is in the front, the right foot in the back is in the, the back, the toes on the right foot, I hear I said three to five o'clock, but I think two to three o'clock is more reasonable we press the pinky edge blade of the back foot into the mat. So in this photo here, it's my left foot that's back behind me. So I'm pressing the pinky edge blade of my left, left foot down in. Now I'll describe this when we get onto the mat. Of course, a lot of repetition, which is intentional, but you're, you often will hear this cued as um, if you draw a straight line from the front edge of your mat to the back edge of your mat, have the heels in one straight line. That is one option that fits a very narrow ranges of bodies. So you can also take the heels out much wider. Uh, another cue, hips or shoulders squared to the top edge of the mat. So I use this cue sometimes, and it's not really that important to me. So this is sort of an idealized version of this pose. I do think it has some value. And as we had, like, if you think about the options with the hands and arms and chair pose, we have all of those same options here. So your hands could be stacked on the front thigh. So right hand on that right thigh, left hand on top of the right. You could have thumbs at the sternum, hands at heart center, or extend the arms up overhead. And I would refer to these actually as warrior one arms. So biceps framing the ears, hands are alive and engaged, pinky fingers spiraling in toward one another. So now I'll have you move onto your mat and I'd like you to be able to, to, to get you a, a sense of what warrior one feels like in your body. In contemporary Western yoga, at least the way that I've seen it taught, three-legged dog is a pose that's typically used um, as a transitional pose from a downward facing dog to a, a standing pose. So usually a warrior one, warrior two, crescent warrior, low lunge, something like that. So we're gonna break down and look at the three-legged dog. 
So to that end, first, come back into your downward facing dog. And then from your down dog, lift your right leg up toward the stars. Now, I'd like the hip to be close. Sometimes you'll see people open the hip. It'll be easier to see if I use my left leg. Open the hip up wide. I like this close. So turn the toes down to face the earth. Press through the heel of that left leg, that raised leg, as if you were trying to touch the wall behind you, to, to stomp on the wall behind you. And then maintain a long neck. So often sun salutations are used as an introduction um, to the practice to warm the body and to, to kind of introduce the, the common sequence that's going to come up over and over and over again. So it's not, it's not that typically that sun salutations have anything to do with the peak pose of the practice. But if there is a peak pose of the sun salutations, I would say it's probably warrior one. All right, so we're going to look at that. Now, warrior one will, could be cued from a downward facing dog in contemporary Western yoga, at least in like the Baptiste inspired vinyasa that, that's so popular in the United States right now. It'll often be cued for a three legged dog. So I'm going to show up from both places and then I'll break down the pose. So, first, I'm going to start a downward facing dog. And it's possible to just be cued to draw the right leg forward and rise up into warrior one. All right, so that's a possibility. I'm going to come back to downward facing dog. What I see more commonly is people cueing a three legged dog, lifting the right leg up toward the stars and then exhale, step it through. Now, if I was cueing this, I might say, replace your right hand with your right foot. All right, but that's not going to come easily to every practitioner. So notice if your foot gets stuck along the way, that's okay. Reach that hand on that same side. So this is my right foot. I'm going to reach my right hand down and just guide that right foot forward. Bring your left toes, oh, 8 to 10 o'clock. So the right toes are at 12 o'clock toward the top edge of the mat. Toes on the left foot, 8 to 12 o'clock. Now this will often be cued for heels to be in one straight line from the top to the bottom edge of your mat. But will also be cued often um, to square the hips of the shoulders to the top edge of the mat. Most bodies can't do that. It's okay to do go wide with that back leg. Let me change my orientation here to show you what I mean. So left leg is forward. If I, I've got my toes on my right foot at 12 o'clock, toes on my left foot at 8 to 10 o'clock, um, my heels are in one straight line from the top to the bottom edge of my mat. Look what happens if I try to square my hips or my shoulders toward what is now my imaginary top edge of my mat. Um, it doesn't feel good in my body and it's not particularly square. But if I step that left foot out nice and wide, ah, much more square. So warrior one is a closed hip pose. So let me come back. It was regular orient demonstration orientation, right? So the sensation, the muscular engagement with the legs is as if you're pressing them apart. So ground down into all four corners of your right foot, the pinky edge blade and heel of your left foot. If it's possible for your body, if you can do it pain-free, press that pinky edge blade of your left foot down in contact with the earth. Now, heart is open towards the top edge of your mat. Um, options for your hands. They could be on that front thigh. They could be at heart center. Or you could reach your fingers up toward the stars, biceps, framing your ears, spiral your pinky fingers in toward one another, right? And often teachers will cue for some other things here, depending on what they're trying to do with the practice. So often a lot of great shoulder and thoracic spine work can be done from here. But this is um, the way that I would teach a basic warrior one. Now to get out of this, the transition is often gonna be, um, we'll, we rise on the inhale, we fall on the exhale, right? So inhale right here, Exhale, release your hands down to the earth. Step your right leg back to meet your left. And we're in high plank. As I mentioned, warrior two isn't necessarily a part of a sun salutation sequence, but sometimes it is included at, as, as a part of the last sun salutation um, beat. So I am going to include some instruction for this here. 
what I consider to be the key feature, the toes on the front foot. So in a, this practitioner in this picture, her right foot is forward. So toes on her right foot are at 12 o'clock. The pinky edge blade of her left foot is parallel to the back edge of the mat. You will see her arms are parallel to the earth and extended toward the front and back edges of the mat. And look at the quality of her hands. She has a, a balanced sattvic level of energy in both hands. If you look at her gaze, this practitioner is gazing out over the middle finger of her right hand, of her front hand, which is a really common way to cue it. And it's right, but it's also right. Sometimes it's friendlier to the neck to shift the gaze in the same direction as the sternum. So that's, if you choose to do that in your body, that's also right. So the other thing, and I will highlight this um, when we get onto the mat to practice this, but I often cue both myself and other people to draw my belly button toward the sternum, which helps us prevent swaying in the back. So move on to your mat, and I'd like you to be able to try Warrior Two out for yourself. Not every sun salutation series is gonna include a Warrior Two, but it's sometimes included, and it'll just take a moment for me to help prepare you for that. So um, in the context of sun salutations, generally warrior two pose will be cued from warrior one. So let's start in warrior one, right? And I'm not gonna totally re-cue warrior one, of course, that's not a good use of your time or mine, but I did wanna mention my feet are super wide like railroad tracks. I mentioned when we talked about warrior one when that was an option, right? So that's gonna mean shifting my feet during this transition. So usually, again, we rise on the inhale, we fall on the exhale. It's also a good transition point. So if I was cueing from this warrior one on the last sun salutation B of the series to go into a warrior two, the way I would do that, I would have you inhale right here in warrior one, exhale, open up into Virapadrasana warrior two. So notice I had to step that left leg back. So now pinky edge blade of the left foot is parallel to the back edge of your mat. Right knee is floating over your right ankle or back from it. What I don't want is forward, right? So if you notice that, if your right knee is forward of your right foot, walk that right foot forward. Now scoop your belly button towards your sternum, arms parallel to the earth, and hands alive but not over flexed. So I would also like stack joints. In warrior two, float your head over your shoulders, over your hips. Right, in here, muscular engagement. I'd like the pinky edge blade of your left foot pressing down into the earth. You could try two things, try two things. One, draw the heel of your right foot, drag it back like you were trying to touch the big toe edge blade of your left foot or spread them apart. See how both of those levels of engagement are. Now this will often be cued as gaze is over the middle finger of your right hand, right? And that's not wrong, but it's also not friendly for every neck. Your gaze could also be out over what is now the left-hand edge of your mouth, right? It could be at the horizon. You could look down toward the earth. Do what feels good for your neck. Now, I mentioned the stack joints a moment ago. There's a very human tendency. Often the shoulders and the crown of the head want to come forward toward the knee. So this is most useful. Sometimes in studio spaces, you'll have a mirror. If you have the luxury of the mirror, draw your head back so it's floating over your shoulders, floating over your hips. Now, one other thing, and I'm gonna change my position to demonstrate this. So coming back into warrior two, right? A couple of human tendencies. One is the hips come back behind us. To counter that, scoop your belly button toward your sternum. And also there's a really human tendency for that front knee, in this case, my right knee, to collapse in toward the big toe edge blade of my right foot. While that's not necessarily wrong, it's really hard on the medial meniscus. So you want that right knee pressing back out toward the pinky edge blade. Sometimes you can even encourage it with your hand. There, nice and open, arms parallel to the earth. And this is our warrior two pose. Great job, friends. So now we've gone over basically all of the poses that might be included um, in a sun salutation B. So now we're going to put it all together. So I'd like you to move back to your mat. And just like we did with the sun A, I'm going to run through two rounds of sun salutations B. I would encourage you to allow me to demonstrate. Just watch the first time. And then the second time, if you're inclined to put it all together and work through that sequence with me, I would love to move and breathe with you. All right. Now I'm going to demonstrate a full sun salutation B. 
Um, so uh, once again, like I said, with the sun salutation, a, I think it would be valuable for the first pass through for you to just watch. I won't be doing hardly any queuing other than just the rote basic instructions. Um, and then I'll do a second round. I'll invite you to join me if you like, and I'll give you more intense queuing along the way. But let's start this from, uh, let's say we start from the same place, from a standing mountain pose on an inhale. Sweep your arms up over your head. Axel, sit back into chair pose. Inhale in chair. Axel, find a forward fold. Inhale for a halfway lift. Axel, step back into high plank. Inhale, rock forward on your toes. Axel, knees up or down, low plank. Back of the head is buoyant, friends. Inhale, open your heart. Exhale, downward facing dog. From downward facing dog on an inhale, lift your right heel up toward the stars. Three legged dog here. Axel, step your right leg forward. Rise up into warrior one. Inhale in warrior one. Axel, release your hands down to the earth. Step your right leg back to meet your left. High plank. From here, you could either press directly into down dog or you could flow through a vinyasa on your own. That would be a high plank to a low plank. Any heart opener of your choice. And then we come back to downward facing dog. So on that sun salutation B, first demo, um, I just did one side. Obviously, we want to leave our practice balanced. We want to develop both sides of our body. So the second pass through, we will do both the right and the left sides of the body. Now, use this demonstration in the way that best serves you. So if watching this another time through makes sense for you, you could feel free to do that or get on your mat and practice with me. So typically when I'm teaching a class, um, the first round through both sun salutations A and B, each time we do a pose for the first time, I have people hold it for at least five breaths. I want them to really be able to feel the pose. But then after that, it's something like one breath per movement. Um, but I want people breathing in tandem, moving in tandem with their breath. So it, it won't be fast or anything like that. But if it's hard to keep up, um, notice you can do this at your own pace, no problem. Right, so let's start this from the standing mountain pose again. On an inhale, sweep your arms up over your head. Axel, sit back into chair pose. So we're gonna move as if we've been moving through this a couple of times. Inhale in chair. Axel, find a forward fold. Inhale for a halfway lift. Axel, step back into high plank. All right, so press your index knuckle and thumb down into the mat. Make the back of your head buoyant. Inhale, rock forward on your toes. Knees up or down, low plank. And then inhale, open your heart. This could be easy cobra. It could be upward facing dog. Axel downward facing dog. On an inhale, three-legged dog, lift your right heel up toward the stars. And then Axel, step forward. Maybe replace your right hand with your right foot. Bring the toes on your left foot, eight to 10 o'clock. Ground down into the pinky edge blade of your left foot, all four corners of your right foot. Maybe take your hands, place them on your hip points, square your hips or your shoulders toward the top edge of your mat. And then your choice, hands on that front thigh, heart center, or reach your fingers up toward the stars. That's it, friends. Spread the feet apart like you were tearing your mat into. Inhale right here. Exhale, release your hands down to the earth. Step your right leg back to meet your left. Now you can choose press directly into down dog or a vinyasa, high to low plank any heart opener, and then downward facing dog. So we'll do the other side. Inhale, lift your left heel up toward the stars. Press through the heel of that left foot as if you were stomping on the wall behind you. And then exhale, step your left leg forward, warrior one. So as I mentioned before, your heels can be a one straight line. For me, they're like railroad tracks, spread all the way apart. Engage both legs. Take the arm variation of your choice. Inhale. Exhale, release your hands down to your mat. Step your left leg back to meet your right. High plank. 
again here, you can choose a vinyasa or you could choose to press directly into down dog. But from your downward facing dog on an inhale, bend your knees, look forward, exhale, move to the top edge of your mat. Inhale for a halfway lift. Exhale, forward fold. Inhale, root to rise, come all the way up to standing. Exhale, draw your hands down to your heart center. And then bring your hands down by your waist, palms face forward. And that's a full cycle of a sun salutation B. All right, friends, and that is the anatomy of a sun salutation. So over the last hour or so, we discussed what a sun salutation is. We described how a sun salutation is done. Pose by pose, we broke down each pose in the sun salutation sequence. I highlighted what I consider to be key features of each poses. I provided you with an opportunity to try and to feel each pose in your body. I demonstrated a full sequence and I offered you an opportunity to work through a single sequence of both a sun salutation A and B. So if you have any, if we've left you, left you with questions, right? The worst thing that happens is um, we leave a workshop more confused than when we went there. So if we muddy the water for you, or you've got other questions that build on what we worked on today, or you've got some feedback, we want to make these experiences better and better and better for you each time. You can reach out to me. You can email me at chris at transformationnationyogaandwellness.com. You can find me on both Facebook and Instagram at Transformation Nation Yoga. Um, I have a, a personal Facebook page too, Chris Bishop. But the truth is, friends, um, that name is really common. Chris Bishops are a dime a dozen, and I might be a little tougher to find that way. So I recommend finding me through Transformation Nation Yoga. You also can um, text me. Uh, my cell phone number, now this is a, a, a United States number, but the number is 281-728-3896. As I mentioned, when we started this mini workshop, we're re co-releasing this with a practice session that's a 20 minute sun salutation breath body practice. Um, it's, it's our hope that if you don't come from a yoga background and you would like to have your, breath, your 20 minute morning breath body practice be yoga related, that we have provided you with the tools that you need to be safe and to be successful in that. So looking forward to moving and breathing with you soon, friends. Blessings to you and your family. And this concludes our workshop.